Looking for magic cards? At flipsidegaming.com you can now use the promo code LVD to get a 10% discount on orders over $10 while supporting the channel at the same time. Hello and welcome to another modern gameplay video. Today we're taking a look at Tribal Zoo, a multicolor aggro deck that's built around Tribal Flames, a 2 mana sorcery with domain, saying Tribal Flames deals X damage to any target where X is the number of basic land types among lands we control, and since we are playing modern where we have access to the fetch land and shock land mana base, it's very easy to get all 5 basic land types in play by turn 3. For example, we could fetch up a Sacred Foundry, counting as a mountain and a plains, we could fetch up a breeding pool, counting as a forest and an island, and then we just need any black land, like for example Godless Shrine, counting as plains and swamp, and we would have all five basic land types with just three lands in play, and now Tribal Flames deals five damage to any target for just two mana, which is quite a bargain. And because we're already going through the trouble of playing a lot of fetch lands and shock lands to enable our Tribal Flames, we're also playing with a bunch of landfall creatures. We've got the full four copies of Steplings, so one mana for an O1 with a landfall, saying whenever a land enters the battlefield under our control, Steplings gets plus two plus two until end of turn. And of course, combined with fetch lands, it means that Steplings can reliably attack for four damage every turn. So when a Wooded Foothills, for example, enters the battlefield, it gives Steplings plus two plus two, and then we can sacrifice it to search up one of our many shock lands, and then Steplings will get plus two plus two once again and get in the red zone for four damage. And we can even get crazier with Renegade Rallier, as we'll get to in a second. And then alongside Steplings, we also have the full four copies of Play the Geopede as another landfall creature that gets plus two plus two whenever land enters the battlefield under our control, starts out as a one one creature with first strike instead. So let's take a look at our entire decklist, starting out with our one drops, where we've already covered all four copies of Steplings. We also have all four copies of Wild Nakadal, one mana for a 1-1, one -one, that gets plus one plus one as long as we control a mountain, and plus one plus one as long as we control a plains. And thanks to our fetch land, shock land mana base, it's pretty trivial for us to have both a mountain and a plains in play, and be able to cast Wild Nakadal, turning it into a one mana 3-3, three -three, which is a pretty good deal. Then we also have all four copies of Lightning Bolt, a nice cheap removal spell that can also go upstairs to finish off an opponent. And our final one drop is two copies of Seal of Fire, which is definitely weaker than Lightning Bolt, but it does have some interesting implications in this deck, one of them being that Seal of Fire is an enchantment, and if we sacrifice Seal of Fire, we'll have an enchantment in the graveyard, which grows our Tarmogoyf, adding an extra card type in the graveyard. And Seal of Fire also synergizes nicely with Renegade Rallier as a way to enable Revolt and as a permanent to get back from the graveyard with the Renegade Rallier, as we'll see in just a second. Then at 2 mana, we've already covered Play the Geopede as another nice landfall creature getting plus 2 plus 2. We've got all four copies of Tormogoyf as a nice beatdown creature whose power and toughness is based on the number of card types in each graveyard. So that includes creatures, lands, sorceries, instants, planeswalkers, artifacts. Uh, tribal and enchantment. We are not really maxing out on Tarmogoyf in this deck in that we don't have any planeswalkers, artifacts or tribal cards that will often end up in our graveyard. Even though Tribal Flames has tribal in the name, it's not actually a tribal card with the tribal subtype. But uh, Tarmogoyf is still a pretty reliable 3-4 in this deck and can maybe get up to a 5-6 if uh, we do happen to put a Seal of Fire in our graveyard. And of course the opponent can also cooperate and maybe put a planeswalker or artifact in our graveyard to help us grow the Tarmogoyf and just a nice beatdown creature for two mana. Then of course we've got all four copies of Tribal Flames, which is the only sorcery in our deck to help us grow Tarmogoyf. And finally two copies of Lightning Helix, as a Lightning Bolt that also gains us three life, and an instant to feed Tarmogoyf as well. Then at three mana we've got four copies of Renegade Rallier, which I've already mentioned a few times, a 3-2 creature with Revolt, saying when a Renegade Rallier enters a battlefield, if a permanent we controlled left the battlefield this turn, return target permanent card with convert mana cost two or less from our graveyard to the battlefield. So the most straightforward application of Renegade Rallier is that on turn three, we play a fetch land, sacrifice it, grab a shock land, so we can play Renegade Rallier, of course, a fetch land leaving the battlefield enables revolt on Renegade Rallier, and then when Renegade Rallier enters the battlefield, we can perhaps return that fetch land from our graveyard back to the battlefield, and if we can sacrifice a fetch land twice, then of course we get to enable landfall up to four times, so we could be giving our step links and play the Geopede plus eight plus eight, 
which is a lot of extra power and toughness to help us close out the game and can lead to potential turn 3 kills if we lead with step links into play the Geopede, into Renegade Rallyer and double fetch land. So that's a pretty exciting part about the Renegade Rallyer. Then we have some more built-in synergy thanks to our Seal of Fire as an easy way for us to enable Revolt. When we sacrifice Seal of Fire, it counts as a permanent leaving the battlefield and then we can always return the Seal of Fire itself if there's no other permanent with Converted Manacles 2 or less that we want to return instead. So it makes for a nice repeatable burn spell. And then it could always happen that a creature we control dies during our turn, and we get to enable Revolt that way, and maybe return that same creature from our graveyard back to the battlefield so it can fight once again. And then topping off our curve at 4 mana, we've got all 4 copies of Bloodbraid Elf as a nice 3-2 with haste and cascade. So we keep revealing the top card of our library until we reveal a non-land card with convert mana cost 3 or less, and then we can cast it without paying its mana cost. So we're always hoping to hit something juicy like a Tribal Flames for 5, or maybe a Tarmogoyf to keep up the pressure. And if we sack the fetch land, getting a Renegade Rallyer is pretty sweet as well. So Bloodbraid Elf always leads to some exciting moments. And after sideboard, we can always hope to hit one of our high impact sideboard cards for the matchup. And that's also why all the sideboard cards have converted mana cost 3 or less, so we can always hit them with the Bloodbraid Elf. Before taking a look at our spicy singleton sideboard, let's take a quick look at our mana base, which is an important piece of the deck. We've got a lot of fetch lands, 15, which is a lot more than you see in typical modern decks, because of course we want to have as many fetch lands as possible for landfall. We are maxing out on all the Naya, red, green and white fetch lands, 4 wooded foothills, 4 windswept heaths, 4 arid mesas, and then we also have 3 verdants to round out to fetch lands. Then we've got one basic forest and one basic plains to help us play around cards like Blood Moon and to have something to fetch in case of Path to Exile or in case of Field of Ruin. And then we've got seven shock lands, one of each. The only ones we're not playing are Watery Grave, Blue Black, Blood Crypt, Black Red and Hallowed Fountain, Blue White. Otherwise we've got them all. And then taking a look at our spicy singleton sideboard. Of course, since we are playing all these multicolor lands, we get access to all five colors in our sideboard, which can lead to some interesting sideboard choices, and we can kind of tailor it to the expected meta game. In the sideboard, we've got a one copy of Path to Exile as more removal for bigger creatures. We've got a Stony Silence against Artifact decks, a Lingering Souls as a nice grindy card for the mid-range and control matchups, and a Timely Reinforcements as a great card against aggro and burn strategies. Then in black we get access to some hand disruption with Thoughtseize, as well as Collective Brutality, which also shines against the burn matchup. Then in red we get access to some more land hate, with Alpine Moon against the Tron and Valakut decks. Ancient Grudge has more artifact hate, and Fulminator Mage also helping us blow up lands against the Tron and Control matchups. Then in green we have some more artifact and enchantment removal with Seal of Primordium, which also synergizes nicely with the Renegade Rallyer as a Revolt Enabler. Same can be said for Fulminator Mage, but you can't always afford to wait a turn on sacking the Fulminator Mage. It's a bit easier with the Seal of Primordium. We also have Kitchen Things as a nice recursive threat that gains a bunch of life, which shines in the removal heavy matchups and the burn matchup. And then we have a Knight of Autumn as a nice versatile card that can gain a bunch of life against Burn and also destroy artifacts and enchantments. And then in blue we get access to Geist of St. Traft as a nice hexproof threat and is a static caster as a way to deal with a lot of one toughness creatures. And finally Nihil Spellbomb as Graveyard Hate that also synergizes nicely with our Renegade Rallyer. So that's our deck, now let's jump into some games and see how the deck does. Alright, we're on the play. I should mention that the London Mulligan rule is in effect. On Magic Online, this hand seems keepable, a little bit threat light with only the one step links, but double fetch land to pump it up. So yeah, with the London Mulligan rule, we Mulligan always have a seven card hand, and then depending on how far we Mulligan, we have to put a number of cards back on the bottom of our library. So that makes Mulliganing less punishing. So we could play Godless Shrine, I think I'm gonna lead with Plane still into step links here. Playing Godless Shrine could be better if we need to play an early Tribal Flames. Playing Planes saves us a bit of damage in case we're up against an aggressive deck where our life total matters. Always nice when you don't have to play a fetch land in order to play an early Staplings so you can save those to get in more damage. Turn 1 Expedition Map of Island, so it could be a blue Tron deck. We are going to want to fetch a Red Source for Helix or Seal of Fire. Uh, probably Red Green is my guess. So let's get a Stomping Ground here. And we'll pay the two life, so we get access to our Lightning Helix. And I think we'll just Helix main phase here. On the off chance that our opponent's playing counter spells. So our opponent's down to 13. Next turn we get to attack for 4 once again. 
Hopefully we pick up something like a Renegade Rallyer, ideally, or some other threat. Alright, Thermogoyf is excellent. So we want to be able to play Thermogoyf and Seal of Fire this turn. So we either need to grab a Red Source or a Green Source in addition. And we also want to get our Blue Mana. So that means we either get a Steam Vents or a Breeding Pool. So let's play our Fetch Land. Sack it. And get a Breeding Pool here. And we'll pay the 2 and attack for 4. Opponent could have a Remand, they could have Condescend. I think I'm going to lead with the Thermogoyf in case of Condescend. And then we'll play our Seal of Fire. Which will also help us pump Thermogoyf. Could save the Seal of Fire until next turn. To keep playing around potential counter spells, but I'll just play it out now. And we'll keep it in play, don't think there's a reason to fire it off right now. Opponent did not sag the expedition map, so that's interesting. Well, if our opponent is on a blue Tron deck, they haven't played any Tron lands yet, so maybe it's something else. If our opponent did have something like an ensnaring bridge, there's some interesting things we can do with our fetch land, so we can still attack with maybe a zero-powered steplings, and then before damage, we can sack a fetch land to go get another land, so we can get in two damage. But with the amount of cards our opponent has in hand, Ensnaring Bridge would not really do much at the moment. Alright, our opponent concedes, so on to sideboarding. We don't quite know what we're up against. Guessing it's a blue Tron deck, considering the islands and the expedition map. Against, let's say, a blue Tron deck, how would I sideboard? Fulminator Mage makes sense. Uh, Geist as a Hexproof threat could be okay. We've got Ancient Grudge to blow up some artifacts. Alpine Moon to name one of the Tron lands. Brutality against Blue Tron might not be terrible since we get to strip away some instants and sorceries. Thoughtseize is great against any Tron variant. And of course Stony Silence to shut down those maps and other trinkets. Knight of Autumn might be a little bit too slow. Seal of Primordium is worse than Ancient Grudge for the most part. I'm not sure if it's good enough to still bring in, but we don't want to over sideboard. Especially on the draw when they can sacrifice their expedition map before we get a chance to kill it with our two minor removal spells. It's mainly just to kill artifacts like Oblivion Stone, since most of their other top end cards aren't artifacts, and if we kill a Worm Coil Engine, they still get the two Worm Tokens afterwards. So artifact removal is not as good as it may seem, but against the Blue Tron variant, where they might have Chalice, it gets a little bit better than against the traditional Tron variant, where killing something like a Chromatic Star still draws them a card and isn't really worth your time. So out of these cards, do we want to bring them all in or just a few? And which cards are we taking out? The burn spells seem like the most cuttable, so Lightning Helix, Lightning Bolt can come out, and Seal Fire as well. And uh, I guess we bring these in, and then we gotta bring one card back into the deck, I guess we'll go with the Lightning Bolt. Yeah, I think we'll try this. I guess Path to Exile also merits some consideration, as it can take out Worm Coil Engines. Should maybe consider that too, although we could be completely wrong about the opponent's uh, deck here, and then we might have sideboarded incorrectly, but I, I guess I'll bring in the path over the bolt and uh, try this. Alright, we're on the draw with a one-lander. Don't think we can keep a one-lander, sadly. Alright, this is better. And which cards do we want to keep? Let's say we keep fetch land and sacred foundry, then what do we fetch? We want to fetch a green source, so we could get green blue or green black. If we keep steam vents, then we will need to fetch green white. Either way, we're keeping I think I'll put back the Steam Vents, since if we draw a Step Links, we can play Sacred Foundry on 1 without having to waste our Fetch Land, and then we can Fetch to get in for damage with Step Links, so keeping this, the White Source for turn 1 makes more sense. Our opponent is indeed on Blue Tron, as we see Urza's Tower. So our first hand had quite a few hate cards for the matchup, this hand does not, so hopefully we draw into some effective cards for the matchup. While Nakal turn 1. Alright, so... I guess uh, now we will have to fetch, but Sacred Foundry plays well alongside Wild Nacoddle, so that's good. And then we want to get green, black, or green, blue. We sideboarded in more black cards than blue cards, so I'm gonna go with green, black here. Overgrown Tomb, take two, play Wild Nacoddle. And next turn we get to add a Thermogoyf to the board. Could have also been correct to just put a Renegade Rallyer on the bottom and keep three lands instead. If it was a fetch land, I would be more into keeping it, since it has a lot more upside than just a shock land, but we'll see how this plays out. And Chalice of the Void on 1. 
don't care about it too much. I mean, definitely has an effect on the game, but uh, our hand can ignore it. And we boarded out a lot of one drops as well. All right, more tribal flames. Let's uh, take two, attack for three, and play our goif. Maybe our opponent thinks we're on a death shadow deck where chalice on one would be a lot more effective. Next turn we can tribal flames pre-combat to grow the goif. If the expedition map gets sacrificed, the goif will grow as well. Opponent did not play a second Tron land, so we don't have to fear the turn 3 Tron. And we've got a lot of burn in hand. This is 12 points with just the two lands we have in play. Opponent with a spatial contortion. Fair enough, so that's going to kill the goif. Despite adding an instant to the graveyard, there's still only land an instant. If we did have a sorcery in the graveyard, then goif would have survived. So that slows down our clock quite a bit. Staplings would get countered by Chalice of the Void. Staplings also wouldn't help us enable Revolt for Renegade Rallyer since it never enters a battlefield in the first place. So we'll fire off Tribal Flames for four. And hopefully we can get a few more hits in with this Wild Cattle, And then finish them off with Tribal Flames. We could wait until we hit an island so we can fire off two five damage Tribal Flames here, we'll see. Opponent will be able to assemble Tron next turn, so that's pretty scary. A fetch land would be a great draw, since that would let us Renegade Rally or back Tarmogoyf. And there we go. Alright, let's uh, get in there. Alright, opponent has a response. Cyclonic Rift, Bouncing, Wild Nakaddle, fair enough. So we won't be able to replay it because of Chalice, but it does mean that our Renegade Rallyer will resolve as our opponent's tapped out. So I'm guessing we need to get a Steam Vents here as our only option. And get back Goif, which is pretty big now. And then hope that uh, our opponent doesn't have a great finisher in hand now that they have all the mana in the world, thanks to completing Tron with Expedition Map. And yeah, next turn we could threaten Lethal. And we didn't really have any hate cards in this particular hand, so it was just good old-fashioned beatdown with Tribal Flames to back it up. And our opponent had some interaction along the way as well. Something like an Ugin would be pretty bad for us. Although double Tribal Flame still gets the job done. And if we draw a land, we can cast both in the same turn since we have two red sources. Alright, it's not our Spatial Contortion killing the Renegade Rallyer. It's not so bad. And we're gonna pass a turn. Thermogoyf a 5-6. And another land means we can cast both Tribal Flames here. So let's attack for 5. And just one of these Tribal Flames needs to resolve. Let's try with the first one. And that works. Sweet. So we managed to beat Blue Tron with some nice Tribal Flames for the win. On to the next one. Alright, we're on the play. And our opening hand looks fine. We've got uh, double Staplings with double Fetch Land. And a Tarmogoyf to boot. We'll have to decide whether or not we want to run out double Staplings or Staplings into Goyf. But we have the White Shock Land, so we don't need to waste Fetch Lands to run out the Staplings early. Lead with the Temple Garden. And play our first Staplings. And let's see what we're up against. Turn 1 Island into Serum Visions, so it could be any blue deck. Alright, another Fetch Land. I think I'm leaning towards uh, playing another Staplings. And then we can Fetch right now. Maybe should have played another fetch land instead here. Doesn't matter a whole lot. I guess we'll get a stomping ground here. Yeah, we probably should have played another fetch land and grabbed another land instead here. So we could cast the tribal flames for five if need be next turn. Because with the current configuration of fetch lands and shock lands, we wouldn't be able to get both black and blue mana in play for a tribal flames for five. But given that we have two fetch lands and a godless shrine, it's not going to matter a whole lot since we're probably going to play a Goyf next turn anyway. It's going to be double island for Chard Course, draw to discard. Discard's an island, so we still don't really know what we're up to. Bloodbraid Elf, a nice pickup. So let's fetch for a tapped Steam Vents and play a Goyf. So these Steplings are getting in a lot of damage. And Steplings also plays nicely around potential counterspells, since you can just play fetch lands and get in for damage. Don't need to add more to the board. Let's attack for eight. And then fetch land next turn is lethal by itself, but we get to add a Thermogoyf and a Bloodbird Elf on top. 
All right, let's see what our opponent comes up with. Ooh, a disrupting shoal. Countering our Tarmogoyf, X equals two. And our opponent exiled a mission briefing. Fair enough, was not expecting a counterspell when they were tapped out here, but disrupting shoal is uh, one of them. Pact of Negation, the other one, but that one they probably wouldn't cast in this spot. So Disrupting Shell makes me think they're probably on some sort of Delver of Secrets type deck. A Tempo deck, but they just didn't have an early creature. They could have Ninja of the Deep Hour as well. Bunch of Cryptic Commands, and yeah, there we see Delver of Secrets. A little bit late to the party, it's gonna have to Chum Block here. The Cascade on Bloodbraid also plays around counter spells nicely. Since uh, if they counter the Cascade card, we still get the Bloodbraid. If they counter Bloodbraid, we still get the Cascade card. So let's uh, run out our fetch land here. And I will Bloodbraid instead of Tribal Flames here. And our opponent scoops it up. All right. So how do we want to sideboard against Mono Blue Delver? Collective Brutality seems decent. Uh, Static Caster could shoot down Delver of Secrets before they transform. Don't know if our opponent is on Phantasmal Bearer or Phantasmal Image. Sometimes you'll see those in these types of decks. Don't think we need Kitchen Things, although they could be off to a fast start and then the Lifekin's useful. Uh, Lingering Soul seems fine. With the flashback it's nice against counter spells and gives us some flyers to block Delver of Secrets. Don't think we need to sideboard much for the matchup to be honest. Think I'm just bringing in Brutality and Lingering Souls. On the draw, I don't hate shaving some play the Geopede since it can be a little bit slow sometimes. Probably one of the weaker cards. And all the removal seems fine to get rid of their Delvers. Um, I guess our opponent could also have the artifact that steals our creatures, so we might want some artifact removal. But that's pretty narrow and otherwise our artifact removal doesn't do a whole lot. I guess Knight of Autumn could be decent because of that since it's pretty versatile there. But uh, I think we'll stay put for now until we see more. All right, well, we drew both our sideboard cards in our opening hand, so we'll get to see them in action. And we've got a Windswept Heath to grab our black mana, so this is a keep. Turn one Serum Visions. And a Wild Nakadal right on time. I don't think there's a way for us to cast a Wild Nakadal on one, have black mana, and have Wild Nakadal be a 3-3. Definitely want to play the Wild Nakadal so we could get an Overgrown Tomb, or we could just play Breeding Pool, and then next turn we can get a Godless Shrine. I guess that's fine. Play Breeding Pool for now. Take two. Play Wild Nakadal. And the next turn we can get the Godless Shrine to let us cast Collective Brutality. Which will make Wild Nakadal into a 2-2. We could of course fetch for Sacred Foundry, so Wild Nakadal is a 3-3. We can Lightning Bolt, but then we won't have the black mana required for Brutality and the flashback on Lingering Souls. And our opponent fires off a Charter Course on turn two here. So they're tapped out. They could of course have another Disrupting Shoal. Don't think I'm discarding anything to the Brutality, I'm fine just hard casting the Lingering Souls and flashing it back. Opponent discards a Thought Scour. Alright, not a Renegade Rallier. It is tempting to save the Fetch Land until turn 3, so we can get it back with a Renegade Rallier. So there is some consideration to just playing a Steam Vance, tapped or untapped, attack for 2, and not play the Collector Brutality and then save the Fetch Lands. But with so many Fetch Lands in our deck, we're bound to draw one at some point and I would probably lead with Lingering Souls anyway here. Pay the two life, and then will Brutality, making the opponent discard an instant or sorcery card, and see what's up. All right, that's a lot of instants and sorceries right there. Double Remand, Disrupting Shoal, Serum Visions, Thought Scour, and Shard Course. So those Remands are pretty annoying, since we have so many expensive cards in our hands. That being said, our opponent might be digging for a land next turn anyway with the, the cantrips. Disrupting Shoal is a way for them to counter something, although they don't have any 3 mana cards to pitch to the Disrupting Shoal. So I think I'll get rid of the Remand here, since we have so many expensive cards in our hand. We do have a little bit of pressure with the Wild Nakadal, but 3 damage a turn might not be enough, so we do need to resolve another spell here this game. Remand especially powerful against Flashback on Lingering Souls, since not only do they counter the flashback, but uh, the Lingering Souls is still exiled from our graveyard, so don't want to let that happen. Opponent is probably going to go digging with uh, Serum Visions here, yep. Hoping to find a land so they can still keep up Remand. So Serum Visions is gone. And our opponent found a Delver of Secrets, which we could Lightning Bolt. Alright, more Renegade Ralliers. 
I'm kind of liking just playing the Lingering Souls here, and then next turn we can flashback Lingering Souls plus Lightning Bolt to Delver. And they could counter the Lightning Bolt now anyway with the Disrupting Shoals, so much better to resolve a 3-drop. Let's see if the Delver flips. Probably does, considering they set up their top decks. Although they are Thought Scouring themselves, so I guess not. Alright, no flip Delver. Probably means they found a land or another creature here. So Thought Scour is gone, but our opponent's gonna stay back and keep up Remand. We don't want to get the Lingering Souls countered by Remand. I think we start by bolting the Delver here, see what the response is. Then we can still decide whether we play a second Wildna Cattle or flashback Lingering Souls, depending on what they do. Alright, we're gonna Remand the Lightning Bolt, fair enough. So now we get to hopefully resolve the flashback on the Lingering Souls without getting it remanded, which is what we were trying to avoid. I think we're fine to attack with the tokens. Still at 13. And we're about to flashback another Lingering Souls. Probably should have flashed it back to see whether or not it's resolved before committing to our attack here. But I think we'll be okay regardless. So let's see if they picked up a 3-drop to go alongside this Disrupting Shoal. They did not. Alright, so we've got a nice army of spirit tokens. Let's see if Delver transforms this time. Does not, so our opponent's getting pretty unlucky here. Next turn we can Lightning Bolt plus Wild Nakaddle. We've got a nice bit of pressure in play, and some cheap cards that are efficient to play into counter spells. There's a fourth land, so we are in Cryptic Command territory. Opponent still with a Charter Course and Disrupting Shoal in hand. They could also hard cast Disrupting Shoal. It's gonna be a Serum Visions. So they might keep up Shoal for X equals 1. Lightning Helix, also a good one. Probably start by just attacking with everyone, see what they do. And then we can decide whether or not we want to run out a Wild Nakaddle. If we want to maybe make them counter a Burn Spell first. This is 7 damage coming across. We only have a single red, so we can't play both Burn Spells in the same turn here. Alright, what is this? Nimble Obstructionist, 3-1 Flash, Flying... So we could kill that before they get a chance to block with it. It would trade for Wild Nakaddle, presumably. I think we're fine letting that resolve, since then we can just Renegade Valier it back. And get some nice value. So I'll let uh, the trades happen here. Opponent takes four. And hopefully this resolves. Alternatively, we could have gone with Wild Nakaddle and then Lightning Helix end of turn, Bolt you. But they didn't seem to have a card that they wanted to pitch to the Disrupting Shoal last turn, so they probably drew the Obstructionist for the turn. Alright, never mind, so X equals 3, what did they pitch? Psionic Blast of all cards to counter our Renegade Rallier. Alright, so they still have a chart of course in hand that we know of, so countering that Renegade Rallier was pretty key. Could have tried to play around Shoal a little bit better by uh, double spelling instead of trying to go for the 3-drop, but uh, don't think our opponent has too many 3s in their deck to begin with. So Delver gets in, we'll probably see a Charter Course here. Opponent draws two. So they've got four unknown cards in hand, facing four Spirit Tokens. And they know about Lightning Bolt, ooh, Terramander, that's a good one. They probably can transform it right away, and that's what they'll do. But they're still dead here, unless they have another Disrupting Shoal, and now with Stomping Ground we can cast both Burn Spells right away here. So I don't think they can counter both, considering they need to pitch two cards to two Disrupting Shoals, which is four cards, and they only have three. I guess they could have Disrupting Shoal, and Pact of Negation isn't happening with only four lands in play. So this should be game. So we'll Helix them. See if they have the Shoal, and if they do, we'll just Lightning Bolt. Alright, that's game, so managed to beat Mono Blue Delver, on to the next one. Alright, we're on the play, and the sand seems keepable to me. We've got a step links with a lot of fetch lands and then double goif. The goifs will be relatively small to begin with, but they do tend to grow over time. Let's probably just get a temple garden here, and I guess we'll use the windswept heath. Alright, opponent with a turn 1 hissing quagmire, so presumably a blank green midrange deck. Which could be a pretty tough matchup, our opponent's gonna have a lot of interaction, a lot of removal spells, and their own Tarmogoyfs. So what do we fetch? We want to get a red mana, ASCP, and there's no Blood Crypt we can get. I guess 
Stomping Ground is fine. Staplings a 4 5. We'll play the Goyf attack for 4. Just a baby Goyf at the moment, 1 2. But if our opponent ends up killing one of our creatures, then suddenly Tarmogoyf becomes a lot bigger. What's their turn 2 play? It's gonna be Bitter Blossom, alright. Well, if that somehow ends up in the graveyard, it's both an enchantment and a tribal card, so that's two card types for Tarmogoyf. But uh, yeah, the string of chum blockers is pretty effective against our landfall creatures. That being said, Staplings was a good pickup. So I think we just want to get in another 4 damage with the Staplings, since we've got plenty of fetch lands anyway. So I guess we'll grab a Godless Shrine here. Take 2. So we are getting pretty low from all this fetching and shocking, but it's for the greater good. Attack for 4. Play Staplings. Play the second Staplings, second main, so we don't have to sit through... Uh, an extra pair of landfall triggers. Alright, so opponent falls to 11, gets a 1-1 fairy rogue token. Let's see how they uh, deal with our creatures here. It's gonna be their own Tarmogoyf, also just a 1-2. Alright, more staplings. So it could be reasonable to not play the fetch land this turn, instead just play the breeding pool for landfall, play another staplings, and then next turn we can have the fetch land. So all three staplings get uh, plus 4 plus 4. If our opponent has a Maelstrom Pulse, things get a little bit more complicated. So we'll just play the Breeding Pool for landfall purposes. And then, do we attack with everyone? If we attack with everyone, our opponent could double block our Goyf with their Goyf and a Fairy Rogue. And then we would essentially trade our Goyf for a Rogue token, which isn't ideal. So it could be okay to just send in the Staplings for now. Opponent is fetching, so either they're getting a tap land or they're fail pushing something. Alright, looks like Fatal Push is happening. Takes out Staplings, and now all of a sudden they have a good block on our Staplings with a Goyf. I think we messed up here. Had we just played our Fetch Land instead of our Breeding Pool, then we're not forced to sacrifice it, but at least we have the Threat of Activation, and they wouldn't have been able to ambush our Staplings the way they did, and we weren't forced to sacrifice it, but at least we would have had the option to play around Fatal Push a little bit better there. The upside is now that we do have 3-4 Goyfs ourselves. One Fairy Rogue gets in there. And what's the follow-up? Nothing. Alright, more Goyfs. And then we can not sacrifice the Fetch Land unless we need to pump the Staplings once again. And this time I will send the Goyfs. Just want to get our opponent low here so that the Bitter Blossom ends up killing them. Opponent's just jumping and then the Goyfs bounce off each other. That's fine. Another Fatal Push. No, it looks like 2 mana removal, abrupt decay. Alright, so opponent's staying afloat here. Play another Goyf. So we just want to draw some burn spells here to get the uh, game over with. The Hissing Quagmires could come in as pretty good blockers here too. As 2-2 two -two Death Touchers. And it's gonna be Kalitas. Alright, Kalitas could gain him life. So that... Uh, Changes the equation. Fairy Rogue gets in there. So if we draw Tribal Flames now, are we just pointing it at Kalitas instead? Probably. Alright, speak of the devil. So yeah, if we were to Tribal Flames, we add a Sorcery to the graveyard, so the Goyfs grow up to 4-5. So we could Tribal Flames put the opponent to 3, they fall to 2 from Bitter Blossom. But I don't think we can deal 2 by attacking here, so we probably just need to kill Kalitas. And this will also grow the Tarmogoyf, since there wasn't a sorcery in the graveyard yet. So they're 4 or 5 now. So I think we do send everyone here. They could block Staplings with Goyf, Chump, Goyf with a Fairy Rogue, take 4. But Staplings isn't too important anymore anyway. And we would get a nice big chunk of damage in. So I think it is worth it to send. And if they double block a Goyf, then we can get in 6 damage. Just want to get them low so another burn spell wins us a game. Alright, opponent's playing it conservatively. And we'll get a Steam Vance here. And we should only take 7 on the way back here if the Hissing Quagmire, the Token and Goyf attack. Of course, if they can add another card type to the graveyard, for example by making themselves discard a Planeswalker, then uh, we could be in trouble. Second Kalitas, wow. Well, we'll need a, a second Tribal Flames here. Goyf gets in, puts us to 4. 
Now the Goyfs are big enough to attack into Kalitas. So that's an interesting twist. <laughs> well, doesn't always have to be difficult. Tribal Flames to the face, it's only fair. Trade you a Tribal Flames for a Kalitas. So against Black Green mid-range with Bitter Blossoms, how do we want to sideboard? Probably want a Path to Exile to deal with Kalitas and Goyf. I think Lingering Souls is great in the mid-range matchups. I guess his Static Caster is pretty good, it can take out the Bitter Blossom tokens as well as potential Dark Confidence. Spellbomb affects our Goyf as much as the opponent's anyway. And what do we take out? Seal of Fire grows the opponent's Goyf as much as ours, so that can go. And we'll trim up Play the Geopede as one of the weaker cards in the deck. Alright, we'll try this. Could also make a case for Thoughtseize to take away their high impact cards like Kalitas. But for the most part we're trying to kill them before it comes down. This hand's keepable, no one drop creature, but a nice mix of Thermogoyfs and Lightning Bolts. Alright, path. So how are we fetching? Uh, probably gonna get a Sacred Foundry early, so we get access to these one mana removal spells. So we can play Arid Mesa, get Sacred Foundry, turn 2 we can fetch a green blue land for example for Goyf, or a green black one. So let's play Arid Mesa for now. Opponent gets an overgrown 2 mana of turn. If it's a Dark Confident we can bolt it. No turn 2 play, alright. Let's just fetch our Sacred Foundry anyway here. Opponent is not playing Lightning Bolt themselves, so we are fine to play a Tarmogoyf as a 1-2. Against a Jund opponent, we might want to save Tarmogoyf until it's out of Bolt range, but for now we're good to go. Um, of course, there is a downside that if we play our Goyf, they kill it, and there's a creature and an instant in the graveyard alongside a land, and then our Bolt doesn't kill their Tarmogoyf, but we have a Path and a Tribal Flames anyway, so that should be okay. Let's go ahead and get our Overgrown Tomb, I think. Could also get Breeding Pool. So we brought in Lingering Souls that needs black mana and Static Caster that needs blue mana. So it's kind of a, a toss-up here. They didn't have the Bitter Blossom on turn 2. So I think I'm leaning Overgrown Tomb. Opponent does have the Fatal Push. Now Inquisition of Kozilek. We could have also led with the Geopede instead of the Tarmogoyf. But Geopede has the potential of doing more damage, and we kind of expected our 2-drop to die. Inquisition takes Tarmogoyf. Alright, let's play the Geopede. Now it's a little bit awkward in that uh, we do want to play our lands, so we get access to a Bloodbraid potentially next turn. I think we do want to play it out. We still get the second half of Landfall with our fetch land here still. And uh, being able to cast Bloodbraid if we draw land is pretty important. I'm not going to fetch end of turn. It's more important to keep the fetch land to deal more damage than it is to preserve our life total, considering how much removal we have anyway. Plenty of answers to Kalitas if that happens. And the first strike on Geopede means it doesn't trade for Quagmire. Alright, we did draw Temple Garden, so I think it's Bloodbraid time. Let's uh, run out Temple Garden. And then we want to fetch a blue source with his Verdant, so Breeding Pool is the only option. As much as I would like to get a second red source, I think it's more important that we get a blue source for the Tribal Flames. So let's get the pool. Geopede up to a 5-5. Five five. And we'll Blood Braid. And we already have the path in hand, so if we do find a removal spell, it's a burn spell that we can always aim upstairs. Like this here, Lightning Helix. And that's also part of the reason why we don't play path in the main deck, is that it's an awkward hit of Blood Braid Elf if, uh, if the opponent doesn't have any targets in play. And against the non-creature decks, it doesn't do a whole lot. It's going to be Assassin's Trophy to Geopede. So now we can fetch up a basic. I guess we'll get the plane, so we can still path end of turn if we have to. Don't have a basic mountain, otherwise we would grab a mountain here. Alright, let's get in with the Blood Braid. Opponent down to 12. Opponent could be sandbagging a Kalitas, not wanting to play it out before path and tribal flames happens. Something like a Liliana of the Veil could be annoying. It's going to be a Kitchen Finx, which is also pretty annoying. Although we can pass to exile to get rid of it and not let them gain a 2. And considering they just played a 5th land, ramping them for 1 doesn't seem too bad. And I guess I'll path right now. So we can hit them for 3 with Blood Braid, we've got 8 points of burn in hand. We're gonna keep the fetch land in hand in case our opponent makes us discard with Liliana. And uh, also if we draw a landfall creature we don't want to run out of fetch land yet. I don't think we want to fire off the Tribal Flame, since if Kalitas happens we want an answer to it. 
and a lightning bolt we can fire off at instant speed, so we'll just pass a turn here, make them answer the blood braid, and hope that they don't make us discard tribal flames before they run out Kalitas. Scavenging Ooze, how many creatures are there in the graveyard? We have quite a few, double goif, geopede, so there's three different targets. So that does mean that our opponent can grow the ooze out of bolt range with four untapped green sources here, which makes things a little awkward. We're just gonna untap. All right, another fetch land is not what we wanted. So I'm pretty sure our opponent has a Kalitas in hand. They're gonna force us to use tribal flames on the ooze. And then we're gonna have to deal with Kalitas and we only have a bolt in hand. That being said, the ooze is also a problem. So we kind of have to kill it here. So let's fire the tribal flames on the ooze and take it from there. All right, one Tarmogoyf gone, two Tarmogoyfs gone, play the Geopede gone, and they're gonna exile another card here. Gets rid of the path to exile, fair enough. We could have a Snapcaster Mage in our deck for all they know. And then I'm thinking we do want to run out of Fetchland in case they play a Thought Caesar Inquisition. We can still Lightning Bolt them and get a little bit of value. So which red land would we want to get? Probably Stomping Ground. So it doesn't matter which fetch land we play. Pass a turn, and hopefully we're not going to see Kalitas, but I suspect we will. Yep. All right, well, we'll need another answer here. Well, there we go. Just got to ask, and we draw Tribal Flames whenever Kalitas shows up. So we only have eight points of burn, not enough to kill them, so we'll just Tribal Flames Kalitas here and move on with our lives. So that was a pretty lucky top deck. Opponents down to eight. Hopefully they don't have a second Kalitas. They could have also taken out the Bitter Blossoms. Could totally see that happening. Don't know if they play Dark Confidence. They usually do, but maybe they are on Tireless Tracker instead. And all right, second Kalitas. Their opponent uh, has a lot of them apparently. Well, we can't keep drawing Tribal Flames, can we? <laughs> is this real life? This is the fourth Tribal Flames we've top decked after Kalitas shows up. I guess we should have actually just aimed it at our opponent here. I got distracted for a second by the Tribal Flames top deck. We should have just uh, aimed it upstairs. So Kalitas down. Attack with uh, Blood Braid. So yeah, we should have uh, cast the Tribal Flames on our opponent and then bolted them to death. Don't think they have any instant speed life gain we should have played around. But... Uh, just too funny. We got a little bit too used to pointing tribal flames at Kalitas that we forgot we can also point it at their face. Is this a fatal push? No, just opponents going down to four. Hopefully we don't end up losing the game because of uh, that mistake. They can block with uh, Quagmire here on the Blood Braid. Double Bolt will do it. All right, we'll attack and then go through the motions. Wow. Sometimes I wonder if there's like voice recognition built into Magic Online and Magic Arena. You just call for the top deck you need and the program's like, I've got you covered. So Quagmire gets activated. We'll fetch, get our stomping ground. And if our opponent is paying attention, they'll realize that we could have killed them last turn had we Tribal Flames them instead. Well, that was a pretty lucky string of top decks in both games, so incredibly lucky to get away with the win there, but it made for some pretty epic moments. want to thank you for watching, hope you enjoyed this gameplay, and as always, have a nice day. I also want to thank all my patrons for being part of the channel, and you can become a patron yourself today and decide the topic of future videos over at patreon.com forward slash legendvd.